everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order. We'll have a moment of reflection, please. Thank you. Disclosure of pecuniary interest. Okay, today we have a public meeting. Welcome and good morning. Today, there is a public meeting regarding a new township official plan in accordance with the Planning Act. I am pleased to advise that this is being broadcast live on township's YouTube channel where a recording of this meeting will be available. Joint notice of today's meeting and the open house held on September the 21st of this year was provided within local newspapers, the township's website, and social media channels as well as being provided to all those who previously participated or indicated a desire to participate in the official plan review in accordance with the Planning Act process for a statutory public meeting. The purpose of the meeting is to inform and provide the public and the Planning and Development Committee with an opportunity to ask questions or express views with respect to the proposed new official plan. The format of the public meetings will be as follows. The township's planning consultants will provide a presentation on the new official plan. Second, township staff will provide information on written correspondence received. Next, the public will be permitted to ask questions and express views on the new official plan, and then the public portion of the meeting will be closed. And lastly, members of council will be given the opportunity to ask questions for clarification on the new official plan and provide comments. No decision will be made today following the public meeting, and I'll emphasize that. No decision will be made today following the public meeting. Following this meeting, the information obtained, including from questions and comments submitted by members of the public and committee will assist the township and their consulting team to determine next steps, which includes a follow-up report to township council. If in the future, township council decides in favor of adopting a new official plan, the County of Simcoe will then make a final decision as the approval authority. Members of the public will have provided oral or written submissions, but disagree with the decisions may be entitled to appeal the decision to the Ontario Land Tribunal under the Planning Act. Individuals attending the public meetings by YouTube, Zoom or telephone may email or call the Township's Planning Department to submit contact information to receive notice of the decision. Now I would like to call on the township's planning consultant, team of Jamie Robinson and Wes Crown from a MHBC Barry to please present the information provided within item D1.3 on the agenda plan package. Welcome Mr. Crown and it's all yours. Morning Jamie. Good morning. Wes, I'm just having a technical issue getting things to load. Just if you could start, bear with me, I'll get the presentation out. Sure. Uh, do you want me to, are you going to oh, pull sorry. up? Sorry, Council, Council, Councillor Cox. Sorry, uh, Mr. Crown. And through the chair to Wes and Jamie, how do you want to, like, do you want to do the whole report, like your presentation, and then we ask questions? Is that better, or how did you, I just wondered. Uh, if I can, uh, Your Worship, uh, through to uh, Councillor, um, I, I think the, the the best approach is for us to go through the presentation uh, for principally for the benefit of uh, the public, and then uh, then open it up for questions from the public and uh, deal with any questions uh, from Council as part of the process as well. Okay. The, the principal purpose of today's public meeting, though, is to uh, prescribe it as a uh, uh, presentation and then to hear from members of the public okay. with respect to the proposed official plan. Okay, thank you.
So, Jamie, I'm trying to remember if I'm starting or if you're starting. I think you're starting. Okay, thanks, uh, <laughs> Jamie. Uh, uh, your Worship, members of Council, um, uh, my name is Wes Crown. I'm an associate uh, with MHBC Planning. Uh, also with me today is Jamie Robinson, who's a partner with MHBC Planning, and uh, we have a presentation uh, today, uh, um, a little under uh, 40 slides which will uh, describe the proposed official plan uh, that's been advertised and that's before uh, council uh, today. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, of course, um, we're uh, willing to answer any questions from members of the public or from council. So this is the agenda. Uh, I do want to go through a little bit of what's been uh, completed so far in the uh, official plan review process. Uh, a detailed description of the new official plan, and then we open it up for discussion and questions. Next slide, Jamie. So just to, uh, uh, for everyone to recall that uh, we've been underway with this project since February of 2021, uh, when the township launched the pro process to prepare the new official plan. So this is a, a project of this council uh, and it's a project that has been uh, budgeted by this council uh, to uh, complete during its term. In March uh, of 2021, council held the uh, special meeting under the, um, the listed sections of the Planning Act uh, to gain public input, early public input into the official plan review. In April of 2021, uh, virtual interviews were held with all members of council. Uh, we followed that up in May of 2021 with a survey questionnaire and vision, vision sessions uh, with the public and agencies uh, to, uh, much like with council, to get a sense of uh, what the community was looking for, uh, uh, how it wanted Severn to grow and change uh, over the next 30 years. In August of 2021, uh, we released uh, discussion paper number one and a open house, virtual open house was held in August of, of 2021. In November of 2021, uh, we released a directions and recommendations report and a special council meeting was held to review that report and specifically to uh, review and discuss uh, the recommendations for the preparation of the new official plan that's before uh, council this morning. Next slide, Jamie. So the uh, new official plan um, is, was posted for review and download on, on September 7th of this year. The new official plan, uh, like all official plans, is comprised of two main components, uh, the text and the maps. There are uh, nine schedules or maps that have been appended to the draft new official plan and they address a range of land use policy areas and issues. And then the draft OP text is linked to those schedules and structured to provide guidance to council, its committees, and the public on a range of policy and planning matters that the municipality will face over the next 30 years. Next slide. So uh, I'm going to uh, take the uh, first sort of part of the description of the new official plan, particularly the land use schedules. Um, and then uh, once I'm done with that, uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to Jamie to do a, an overview of the main and key policy directions uh, within the proposed official plan. So as I noted, the uh, new official plan has nine land use schedules and they're listed uh, here on this slide. Um, and some are uh, very specific with respect to their uh, content and subject area. Uh, such as Schedule E addressing uh, the transportation uh, system, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Uh, but this is the list of the schedules. And as always with official plans, uh, you need to, when you're looking at a, your property or a particular property, you need to look at all the land use schedules in the municipality to determine how and if they apply to a particular property. Next slide. So Schedule A to the official plan is the settlement and land use structure. Um, it really describes and details the three main land use forms in the township. 
a Greenland's system, a, a countryside system in the settlement. It's sort of the reflects the the uh, both the growth plan and the county official plan um, in identifying these three main land use systems uh, in the municipality. Greenlands uh, are comprised of the natural heritage and environmentally sensitive areas in the municipality. Um, the countryside uh, um, includes the agricultural and rural lands and also the range of other land uses that are located within these areas. For example, aggregate areas um, are located within the countryside uh, system. And then lastly, the, the uh, settlements. It sets out the location and boundaries of the eight settlement areas, the principal location for growth and development in the municipality under the existing official plan and under the new official plan. It also identifies the uh, South of Division Road secondary plan area in the same way as we've identified the settlement areas. And this is a longstanding secondary plan area that um, provides uh, a range of uh, development permissions with respect to that area of the municipality. Next slide. So this is just a zoom in on a portion of Schedule A uh, both around Coldwater and, the, and around the south of Division Road area. And you can see that each of the settlement areas and the settlement area boundaries are detailed um, on Schedule A. And you can identify the, uh, the beige areas, which are the countryside area and the green, uh, which are the Greenlands uh, system in the municipality. Next slide. So the municipality has two uh, land use schedules, um, what I would call traditional land use schedules in the official plan, Schedule A, sorry, B and C. And much like the existing official plan, uh, we have divided the municipality because of its size into a north and a south part. So Schedule B uh, sets out the, uh, the uh, land use designations uh, that would regulate the use and development of lands within each of those designations. Um, and in this slide uh, showing Schedule B, uh, you can see the different uh, colors that set out in the legend, the various land use designations, uh, which are then applied to the northern part of the municipality. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, which again is another zoom in on, on Schedule B. Um, we've included the legend here, which you can see that uh, water bodies are shown as blue. The country residential designation um, is shown as yellow. Uh, shoreline residential is a, uh, as a brown or beige. And you can see a zoom in on the, uh, a portion of Schedule B, which shows the, uh, a range of the different uh, designations. You can see the shoreline residential around McLean Lake and Matchedash Bay. Uh, you can see the uh, Lafarge Quarry, um, uh, the large Lafarge Quarry uh, centered around uh, Quarry Road, and then the Natural Heritage designation, the Rural and Agricultural designation just southeast of the quarry itself. Next slide. So this is the southern half of the municipality, Schedule C, the land use designations. Uh, again, um, you can see the, uh, um, the full schedule with the uh, legend there as well. If we can go to the next slide, Jamie, we have a, uh, a zoom in on uh, Schedule C, in this case around Artria, and you can see the settlement areas in gray, uh, the country residential subdivision just outside of Artria in yellow, and then the uh, natural heritage um, the, and the agricultural designations that uh, surround and located between um, the South of Division Road secondary plan area, Artria um, and uh, West Shore. Next slide. So I think as I already indicated, the uh, South of Division Road secondary plan area is a, a long-standing approved secondary plan uh, for this area of the municipality. Um, which sets out a range of development permissions and land uses to guide the development of this area. A secondary plan is a more detailed type of official plan. 
that was undertaken, a detailed series of planning and engineering studies that were undertaken historically that get translated into a site-specific secondary plan for a, a defined area of the municipality. So in the new official plan, uh, we've carried forward the uh, South of Division Road secondary plan um, into the new official plan uh, to preserve those rights and permissions that are currently set out in that secondary plan. And this slide shows the uh, Schedule D um, and the land use designations uh, which are contained within the existing secondary plan as well. Next slide. So Schedule E is the uh, transportation uh, schedule for the municipality and transportation is a term that we're using broadly in the official plan. So in addition to it covering the historic uh, uh, terms of road transportation, it's also addressing uh, the full range of active transportation uh, matters in the municipality as well. I can tell you that we've been uh, updating uh, Schedule E um, based on the uh, transportation master plan that is currently underway in the municipality and trying to make sure that the Schedule E and the official plan are consistent with the transportation master plan. Um, and the version that you have in front of you today uh, reflects that draft schedule, which is still under review by the municipality. So the transportation schedule shows the provincial, county and township roads it shows the, the classification of the township roads as well, whether they're arterial, collector, and local. Uh, also details uh, unopened road allowances, the URA and private roads. It also shows future road alignments that are set out in the secondary plan area. It also describes uh, haul routes for the aggregate operations in the municipality and provides uh, a significant level of detail with respect to active transportation matters in the municipality, both trails such as the Utrop Trail and West Shore Trail, uh, but also bike and pedestrian facilities as well. We'll go to the next slide, Jamie. Again, this should be a zoom in on a portion of Schedule E. You'll see the different uh, colors for the various municipal roads showing whether they're classified arterial, collector, or our local roads. You'll see haul routes identified by the green uh, highlight. You'll see the dashed lines, which is used consistently without the schedule, which are showing either proposed roads um, or proposed um, 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 active transportation routes. Uh, and these are, this schedule is specifically intended to guide uh, the management of a multi um, modal transportation system uh, in the municipality. Next slide. So Schedule F is the overlay designations in the official plan and it details four specific uh, designations. The overlays are just like they sound. They're additional policy obligations uh, based on a specific policy matter. Um, that would uh, apply in addition to the land use designations that are set out um, on schedules B and C. Um, there are four uh, overlay designations that are contained in the official plan on schedule F, floodplains, aggregate potential, the TC energy pipeline and waste disposal assessment areas. And if you go to the next slide, uh, Jamie, you'll see a zoom in on schedule F. Uh, which details, for example, the floodplain around Grass Lake. You'll see the aggregate potential, uh, which is uh, in brown on this slide. Uh, you'll see the green for the uh, uh, TC Energy Pipeline. You'll also see the uh, closed waste disposal site shown as the dark purple, just north of Grass Lake, and then the 500 meter waste, dis uh, waste disposal assessment area uh, that's identified around that closed landfill site. Uh, Jamie's going to talk a little bit more about these overlay designations, and in particular the aggregate potential. The aggregate potential designation does not confer any additional or special uh, permissions with respect to the establishment 
of new aggregate operations in the municipality. The new aggregate operations, and like I said, Jamie's gonna talk specifically about this, are under the new official plan, will be obligated uh, to go through the full planning process, including the full public consultation and engagement process uh, before any expanded or new uh, uh, aggregate operations are approved in the municipality. The, the aggregate potential uh, designation, which is based on long-standing provincial mapping, and Jamie will remember the acronym. I can't uh, remember it off the top it's of my head. It's called the AREP papers or the aggregate resource inventory uh, papers. So yeah, maybe just a few words on that, Wes, while we're there, because I know it was a topic that came up at the official at the open house meeting that some time was spent on it. And just to add to what Wes has indicated, the province back in, I think it was the 70s and 80s, they mapped aggregate resources throughout the province. Uh, I'm not sure they got, they didn't get to Northern Ontario specifically, but basically anything Muskoka South, they mapped just as the province has mapped soils throughout the province, there's a Canada land inventory that was done, which maps soil classification. So people have heard of things like prime agricultural lands or class one, two, and three soils or organic soils, for example. So it category, categorizes soils for agricultural production. Well, the, the province did a similar thing with aggregate. And from an aggregate perspective, they identified areas that were primary, secondary, and tertiary potential for aggregate resources. Why did they do that? The main reason is that you can't find, aggregates aren't available everywhere. And they are an important resource because they are used to build roads and build cities and build houses and, and basically uh, construct our communities. So they're, in a, they're in a finite resource at the end of the day that's not available everywhere. And the province, through their documents, recognize the importance of protecting these. So that's one function of, this, of, the, of the aggregate potential overlay. So it mirrors what the province has identified as areas that are quote unquote potential. So if someone were to develop an operation or like to develop an aggregate operation, in anywhere in the municipality, whether it's in the potential area or outside, they are required to go through an amendment to the official plan. Public notice gets provided and also an amendment to the zone file and an MNR site planning process. Um, the, uh, the other thing this does is lets someone that might like to uh, construct a house in the rural area, so anywhere in the white or the the beige where it's permitted, it gives them the understanding that while well, I'm constructing a house in or near or creating a new land use in or near an area that has potential for aggregate resources. So there could be a potential down the road for a, a pit or a quarry in proximity to, to that, that future use. So it does provide that potential flag or caution sign as well. So it's really a sort of cautionary and protectionism protection um, layer that's included in the document and it's again something that the province completed the mapping for uh, some time ago and it's something that the province has very strong policies in their provincial policy statement that protect and those policies flow down through the county official plan and then we may have more discussion on that later, but I just thought that was sort of the right time to touch on some of those points and elaborate on that. Yeah, okay. thanks, Jamie. It, it's um, we're obligated. The Severn is obligated to include the aggregate potential mapping um, in its official plan, and we've done that. Uh, sort of the third component of the aggregate potential um, uh, resource mapping and reflecting them in, in official plan in addition to you know identifying and mapping the finite resource and providing notice uh, to uh, property owners um, across Ontario third component is that if there is a, a development application a planning application that's submitted in those areas um, that is not aggregate related uh, that uh, that applicant must as part of their complete application uh, show how what they're proposing will not impact uh, the uh, future extraction of aggregate in that area. So they would be obligated 
to provide supporting studies to show that what they're proposing um, that you know that there is no uh, mineable aggregate on their site or the property is too small etc or that what they're proposing uh, won't prejudice the future uh, extraction of aggregate in that area so it's really about providing um, in that case uh, you know a, a guidance to uh, applicants for other forms of development other than aggregate. Um, so it really has three purposes, um, which again is something that the official plan needs to include. So we'll go to the next slide. So the, uh, uh, the Schedule G is the source protection uh, policies and uh, overlay designations. Um, it's a, a separate uh, requirement of the source protection plan, um, which was uh, approved in 2015 under the Clean Water Act, and it was updated in 2019. And the municipality updated its current official plan through OPA number seven uh, to incorporate uh, these overlay designations and the relevant policies into the current official plans. And we've carried that forward into the new official plan, both here on Schedule G um, and within the text of the bylaw. The, uh, this schedule in particular shows all of the uh, source protection uh, areas uh, that cover the municipality. Uh, you'll recall that the Clean Water Act came out of the Walkerton uh, inquiry and uh, the source protection policies and the plan really about uh, uh, protecting uh, municipal drinking water systems uh, throughout Ontario. And so that's the principal focus of Schedule G and the official plan as it relates to source protection. Um, the map shows the highly vulnerable aquifers and the significant groundwater recharge areas. It also shows the various drinking water protection zones around um, the uh, groundwater source municipal drinking water systems. And those are WAPAs or wellhead protection areas and the surface uh, surface water source uh, municipal drinking water systems, um, which are the intake protection zones, uh, which again are, are shown on this map as well. Although this is important and critical information, the source protection map and the policies are focused exclusively and principally on protecting municipal drinking water systems and not private drinking water systems. Next slide. Again, just this is a, uh, a zoom on uh, the uh, source protection uh, schedule and you can see the complexity of information around uh, cold water. You can see the, uh, the various wellhead protection areas, A, B, uh, C through D. You can also see the uh, blue hatching, which is the highly vulnerable aquifer and the red hatching, uh, which is a significant groundwater recharge areas. And you can likely uh, understand why we decided to include this on its own separate schedule as opposed to try to combine it with the other uh, overlay designations in, in the new official plan. Next slide. So we have two uh, schedules in the official plan schedule. SA1 and SA2, which uh, provide the detailed land use designations for the settlement areas uh, in the municipality. And then SA1 uh, provides the detailed land use designations for Coldwater, Washago, uh, Port Severn, and West Shore. Um, and again, you can see on the legends, the uh, detailed land use designations. And I think the next slide, Jamie, uh, includes a zoom uh, of the Coldwater area. Uh, again, uh, yellow representing the settlement uh, living uh, designation, which would cover a, a range of uh, residential types, build forms, density and tenure, settlement employment, uh, uh, and uh, community facilities, which are uh, identified by the green color. Just to note that for the, um, the three main settlement areas in the municipality, uh, Coldwater, West Shore, and Wishago. Um, we identify growth areas as an additional policy overlay for those settlement areas. And you can see them identified um, here by the uh, dotted line. So there's the 
urban service area, which represents that portion of cold water that is currently serviced or easily serviced with uh, municipal water and wastewater services. And then a proposed phasing for the expansion of servicing to the community, GA1 being growth area one, uh, GA2, GA3, setting out sort of the sequential uh, extension of full municipal services to the areas that are located within uh, the defined settlement area. And there are detailed policies in the official plan with respect to um, the uh, growth areas. Um, and the, uh, the official plan is linked to the municipality's master uh, master plans for water and wastewater servicing or will be linked to the water and wastewater master plans with respect to how servicing will be uh, expanded and extended to service uh, in this case cold water. Next slide. Again this is uh, schedule SA2 which sets out the, uh, um, the land use designations within the defined settlement area boundaries for Artria, Festerton, Severn Falls, and Marchmount Bass Lake. The next slide, I believe, is just a uh, zoom in on the Artria uh, um, um, schedule. Again, showing the uh, the various land use designations uh, for this settlement area, principally in this case, settlement living and settlement employee, em employment, as well as uh, community facility, which would include um, parks, community centers, uh, libraries, and a range of community facilities that are set out in the text to the document. Next slide. I think I'm taking over here, yeah, Wes. There we go, Jamie. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Wes. And uh, so, where we're going now in the presentation, we're just over halfway through. So, Wes has reviewed all the mapping considerations. What I'm going to do is for, to provide an overview of some of the key policy changes and directions that have been included within the official plan. Um, so with that, where the this first two slides just relate to the structure of the plan. So those of you that have had a chance to review the document are likely familiar with the structure. But the, uh, the start of the plan provides an overview of, of what to expect. There's a section in there about how to read the document. So encourage everybody that's opening it up to have a look at that section it's sort of a user manual on how to how to work through the official plan there's some policies in here about building strong communities and, and building a strong economy and delivering homes to uh, to the community uh, providing in, encouraging the vitality of settlement areas and healthy communities Overall, many of these policies are enabling policies that really set the stage for future council decisions and also that um, guide direction for the consideration of future applications and, and town township initiatives. Other policies or other sections that exist in the plan is we've, in, we've updated the natural heritage and environmental policies We've included some policies related to sense of space and designing new communities and expansion of the existing communities, or specifically related to the expansion of the existing communities. Uh, building resilience within the community through climate change measures. Those are things that deal with such matters as stormwater management and, uh, and flooding hazards. Uh, and we've also, again, got policies related to aggregates, which really mirror a lot of what the province and what the county requires uh, in terms of aggregate protection. So again, there's there's a focus here on on protecting environment or important environmental features and protecting rural areas, but also directing growth to settlement areas. In terms of the key policy directions that the official that this official plan includes, uh, there are some a vision. There's a vision, goals, and objectives that are provided in section one. The vision really focuses to build on that strong small community character, which this municipal, which the township of Severn is, uh, is uh, has been built on. And I'll have to say that I saw in full effect on the weekend at the Coldwater Fair, and it was a well attended event. And that's where you, you really got to see that small town character uh, come to light. 
the agricultural policies and natural policies, there's visions, uh, sorry, there's, there's objectives and goals that support the natural heritage features of the municipality and also rural, uh, rural lands and rural uses. Uh, there are objectives and goals within the official plan, as I mentioned, that deal with things like climate change and economic development and, and growth and specifically focusing growth to settlement areas. And as I mentioned, section one's got that area in there that, that everybody should look at that provides that sort of roadmap on how to read the plan. In terms of growth management, so this is this is an item that's yeah, that's quite important. This really deals with how the municipality is intended to grow uh, over the next 20 years. So what the plan does is it, it's consistent with the approach that the province and the county direct, and that's focus, gro focus growth to settlement areas, uh, specifically those serve fully serviced settlement, settlement areas, so Coldwater, West Shore, and Oshago with also some limited growth opportunities in the non-service settlement areas. We've provided an update on the housing policies, which do support uh, a range of houses, particularly in those service settlement areas, and also ensuring that the municipality does uh, always have an appropriate supply of housing on hand to meet anticipated demand. Um, same goes to the employment lands. A similar approach has been taken to those to ensure that appropriate employment lands exist. And with respect to that, we do expect that there will be an amendment to the official plan required in the future. The reason for that is the county is undertaking what's called the Municipal Comprehensive Review, or an MCR. And that's a process where the county specifically allocates how much employment, how much residential growth the municipalities to receive. So we expect there will be um, some amendments needed to this plan once the county finishes that exercise. They're not complete, complete that, they haven't completed that exercise yet. Um, there are some additional policies related to employment areas that protect uh, those areas for employment and, and limit the conversion of those areas to residential. Uh, the, the importance of that is that employment areas uh, do provide an opportunity for jobs and uh, support those surrounding residential areas. So it is important to protect those those areas. Um, I've already provided an overview of the of the MCR process briefly. What the MCR did identify is that the county um, is undertaking phase two of that exercise. And they did identify that a settlement area boundary expansion would be needed within Severn Township. However, that boundary expansion would not be for, needed for residential lands. It's identified that there are sufficient lands designated in the official plan currently for residential uses throughout the planning period, but that there was a settlement area boundary or is a settlement area boundary expansion required to support uh, what's anticipated for employment lands or the needs for employment lands in the future. So there's some, some additional work to be done on that as the, uh, as the MCR unfolds and as I mentioned, will be an official plan amendment at some point in the future required to address that, uh, that aspect. Uh, the official plan does support the modernization of infrastructure. We know that's an exercise that your public works department is working on currently, particularly in the cold water settlement area with, with the improvements to the water, wastewater, and storm, stormwater management systems in that, uh, that community. And the official plan supports the modernization of systems in, uh, throughout the municipality, uh, both to accommodate growth, but also from an environmental perspective to, uh, to ensure that uh, inputs and, uh, are, are as environmentally friendly as possible. From a countryside perspective, so as Wes mentioned, we've got our settlement areas where growth is focused and then the lands outside of that are generally referred to as the countryside areas. So that's the area where you've got your rural lands and agricultural lands and, and, and supportive uses. So within the countryside area, um, lands are, we've done a review of the agricultural land base in the municipality. So we've provided some refinements to that agricultural land base 
based or agricultural land mapping based on the uh, working with the county through their municipal comprehensive review process. So there's been some refinements there. Um, what's important is that that countryside designation is primarily separated into agricultural designation, rural designation, and um, and the natural heritage designation that protects features. You also see things like your aggregate designations that we talked about previously, but those those first three are sort of the ones that you see the most. And there's different policies that go along with rural and agricultural lands. There's different law creation policies and there's different use policies. So we've worked to to refine the limits of those designations uh, through uh, a careful review of area photo mapping and, uh, and local knowledge of the area and, and through comments from the public. There's policies that promote uh, agri-food strategies. These also support the diversification of uses on agricultural properties and help with farmers to diversify their income and provide other uh, uh, and provide that opportunity for local food. Now, again, these policies are enabling policies. So you have to have willing participants as well, but they really open the door and provide that opportunity for um, for these additional uses that are complementary to our, our rural and agricultural areas to occur. Uh, one of the comments that we heard most through, through the official plan review was a willingness to see additional opportunities for residential development in rural areas. Uh, with respect to that, the official plan is, the, the proposed official plan has been made more permissive than the current official plan policies. However, I'll use the term slightly more permissive. We are limited in how far we can go with respect to that. And the reason we're limited is that the province does provide some limitations in the provincial policy statement. But this plan is also required to be in conformity with the county official plan. So we've basically been as permissive as the county official plan is with respect to rural law creation. Again, the county is the approval authority for this document, and we're required to be in conformity with their official plan. So we're not able to be uh, more permissive from a rural law creation perspective than what the county official plan is. But we've basically taken it as far as we, we can or we believe we can with respect to rural law creation in, in listening to the comments that have been provided through the process, while also requiring that where rural law creation is proposed, a review of to ensure they're not impacting other important uses in the agricultural in rural areas such as agricultural lands and natural heritage features that those features do need to be protected. Uh, in addition from a countryside perspective we've included and updated policies as we've alluded to related to aggregate resources and the importance of protecting those resources. Uh, we have required an official plan amendment for all the new or expansions to existing aggregate resources. So that's an expanded provision. What that requires is ultimately county approval for an official plan amendment and requires additional public public consultation. So where previously a zoning bylaw amendment required for some applications, unofficial plan amendments now required for all applications. So it's a bit more of an elevated test for new operations in comparison to, to what, what existed in, in the previous document. From a natural heritage perspective, what's been completed here is the terminology in, the, in this plan has been updated to reflect and align with what's included in the provincial and the county documents. Uh, there is a natural heritage system that's been developed and uh, we have worked with the county to refine that system. Uh, that's been a, the, what it effectively happened was the county through its MCR process was required to establish a natural heritage system. Council is likely familiar with this and, and well aware of it, but it was quite overstated, we believed in many instances. Uh, and it included a lot of lands that that weren't uh, forested and weren't really weren't really natural heritage 
didn't, didn't pose any sort of natural heritage value specific. So we've worked to refine the limits of those natural heritage, uh, of that natural heritage system through aerial photo mapping and through comments and through working with the county on, on that exercise. Uh, the plan has been updated to include uh, some a modernization of the environmental impact study requirements. So that's to ensure that, that features that are important are protected through development and redevelopment processes. And the hazard provisions in the plan have been updated to reflect provincial policy. The, the PPS or provincial policy statement has some detailed hazard policies and hazards relate to things like lands that are subject to flooding, lands that are subject to erosion hazards and steep slopes, for example. So those are areas where we try to plan and keep development away from those areas so that there isn't a risk to public health and safety. It's really about uh, mitigating that risk to public health and safety. And we know that's an issue that's sort of near and dear across the municipality because you do have some significant rivers in the municipality that are subject to flooding in, both in the south and in the north of the municipality. Uh, just in terms of natural heritage, I think Wes has touched on the source water protection piece a little bit, but that's we've really moved forward the policies that were previously adopted through amendment by this council uh, as a result of the Walkerton in inquiry and consistent with the South Georgian Bay Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. So those policies have been included. They protect municipal drinking water supplies, as Wes mentioned. And we've included some policies that require when new developments proposed to consider potential risks associated with climate change and, and natural hazards. And that's really focused on, on flood prevention and stormwater management. Uh, in terms of, there is a section in the plan and I'm, I'm nearing completion here. I've got a couple more slides. Apologies for the length of the presentation, but as we are all aware, it's a, it's a very important topic and one that's been, been given a lot of time and it's one that will direct decision making in the municipality over the next number of years. So the next slide here deals with supporting movement. Uh, we've updated the road classification system in the, in the official plan. Why is that important? There are different policies that go along with development opportunities, whether you're on an arterial or collector road or what the road classification is. Uh, we've identified where potential upgrades are to the road network. Um, this has been aligned with the transportation master plan as well and, and that exercise that's ongoing. Uh, we've developed some criteria on complete streets and what that relates to is where new streets are developed within and, and new and communities are expanding what what a street can look like and what should be included so things like sidewalks and their location and, and, and those sorts of things obviously the engineering department will have design standards that help implement those policies but those are sort of those um, those directed policies for new development uh, we've included some policies related to key transportation corridors uh, that will ensure the appropriate movement of people and goods in the long term throughout the municipality so it can that the municipality stays connected in that sense. Uh, included some policies related to the new transportation and transit routes that the, the county's been providing uh, that support multimodal transportation, that talk about uh, active transportation and linking your trail networks. The municipality does have a, a good north-south trail network now with the Utah Trail, but provides some opportunities for expanding and connecting to that sort of backbone of the trail network that flows through the municipality. Uh, from a community resilience perspective, so this is focusing on that, that climate change piece and updating the objectives, updates to the objectives have been included that support considerations for climate change, uh, energy efficiency, and those sorts of items when dealing with new development and redevelopment within the municipality. Uh, resiliency, the policies also talk about aging in place and providing a, a mix of housing styles so that folks do have the opportunity 
to age in place within existing communities. That's something that has been lacking in Severn Township is, is the varied housing stock. We're seeing some more of it now with recent development applications that this council's approved in Coldwater. There's a bit more of a mix of housing stock, but for years and years, there was really no new medium or high density housing created in, in the communities within Severn. So the policies speak towards opportunities for that. In terms of the implementation, uh, the implementation section in the plan is something that doesn't get used on a daily basis, but it, what it does do is provide what I'll refer to as enabling policies for council and enabling policies that have helped implement the various goals and directions of the official plan. So uh, it provides policies that encourage the use of your zoning bylaw, provide an opportunity if council wants to establish things like a tree conservation bylaw or excess soils bylaw. And, and, and it also includes transition policies related to existing uses and how they're considered as this document changes. Um, the implementation policies also deal with things like, um, sorry, the next section 18 is interpretation. So it deals with how to interpret land use bo uh, designation boundaries, like how static are they? And where is there consideration for some flexibility or interpretation? Provide some direction on things like accessory uses on properties and, and some definitions. So that's a, a, a section to refer to you if you're wondering about how to specifically use a piece of the plan, or it, there may be some direction that you can find find in that section. So Wes, I think you were gonna wrap things up here with the next steps before we move, put put it back to the chair and we consider some comments from the public. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Uh, uh, Your Worship, um, we're about to turn this back over to you and, and to uh, open the discussion up for comments and questions from those who've given their uh, valuable time today to attend this public meeting. Um, so in addition to uh, submitting comments before the public meeting and at today's uh, meeting as well, comments will be accepted by the municipality uh, until October 5th. Um, and by setting a deadline, it ensures that uh, those that submit comments that they will be reviewed, considered, and form part of the report uh, to Council. Um, as noted, uh, Council will be requested to consider the new official plan and the public comments that have been submitted and any changes that are recommended by staff and uh, your consulting team after the deadline on October 5th. There are two scheduled council meetings right now, November 2nd and 14th. Um, and uh, the intent would be to bring a report forward uh, to council at one of those two meetings. Uh, once council, and, and I think Jamie specifically touched on this earlier, once council adopts the new official plan, um, it does not come into force and effect. Uh, the, Township is obligated to adopt its new official plan, but it then must submit the new official plan to the County of Simcoe as the municipality's approval authority. Um, so once the official plan is adopted and submitted to the county, the county will go through its uh, review process and will issue a notice of decision with respect uh, to the new official plan. And there are timeframes uh, in the Planning Act with respect to how long the county has uh, to undertake its review and approval decision. And the county's approval uh, can be uh, one of three parts, which is just to approve the plan as adopted by council, uh, to approve the plan with modifications, uh, or to refuse the plan. Um, my experience is, is that most often the county um, and upper tier municipalities across Ontario approve the plans as adopted by the local municipality subject to negotiated uh, modifications. So the county will engage directly with Severn on changes that it feels um, are appropriate and necessary uh, to the official plan. So the next slide I think is just a listing of, of how you can stay engaged 
and to follow along on this process. And there are multiple ways to submit uh, comments to the municipality in addition to sort of regular mail um, and dropping uh, your comments off at the municipal office uh, through Facebook, Twitter, the municipality's website, and in particular, emailing the comments to the dedicated project email, which is officialplan at seven.ca. Those comments can be submitted to the municipality. Like I said, uh, comments, uh, we would appreciate if they could be submitted um, um, no later than October 5th of this year. Um, your worship, members of council, uh, it's an important subject um, and probably why we've taken uh, the time that we have to provide a detailed description of the proposed new official plan, but we'll uh, turn it over to you to open the floor to the public. Or sorry, Andrea, Thank I think you, is uh, first going to describe who's yeah. submitted comments so far. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Jamie. I would now like to call upon the Township's Director of Planning and Development, Ms. Woodrow, to summarize any written correspondence that has been received since the publishing of the agenda. Good morning, Ms. Woodrow. Good morning, Mayor Burkett and members of Council and uh, our, consult our consulting team, as well as members of the public. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to note, uh, since the publishing of the agenda, we have had four additional pieces of correspondence. Uh, the first from Infrastructure Ontario, the second from the Chippewas of Rama First Nation, and two pieces of correspondence from Christopher Capitanu, the second of which includes a petition on behalf of several residents within the township. Uh, thank you, Mayor Burkett. That summarizes the additional correspondence. Thank you. Um, would members of council like a bio break before we uh, continue? I think that would be great, Mayor Burkett. Uh, we'll, we'll take a five minute break quickly and come right back. Thank you.
Township staff will call each registered participant in alphabetical order by surname. Please unmute yourself when recognized and turn on your camera if you wish. You will be required to give your full name and address for the minutes. Please note that your comments will also be recorded and live streamed to the Township's YouTube channel and will remain online. The Township does not have the ability to edit the live stream to remove any personal information provided in the course of submitting comments or questions. Please note that due to the great interest in the project and the volume of registrants, we ask that you please be respectful of time when making your comments and asking questions so that everyone has a chance to be heard. I'll now call on Emily, please, our planner, to uh, call the first name. Morning, Emily. Good morning. <laughs> um, the, so I'll go in order by last name. The first registered participant would be Don Atkinson. Give them a second to see if they're <clears throat> unmute here. I'm not seeing anything, so I'll move on to the next. Um, so that would be Susan Crow. If Susan's not here, um, Jerry and Cheryl Elliott Fraser, if they would like to unmute themselves. They are here, so if you just give them one moment. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Oh, wait, actually, I, I, I just wanted to um, listen to the part to, to the to the presentation. I don't I don't have any comments at this time. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the next. Um, that would be Pat Grantis. Um, the next registered participant would be Christopher Capitano, if they would like to unmute themselves. Yes, very good morning, uh, Honorable Mayor and Council members and everyone in attendance. Um, a wonderful presentation. I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, in reviewing the uh, draft of the official plan, I noticed some differences between the existing... Um, Mr. Mr. Capitano, if I can, before you get started, can I get your address? Sorry, 3433 Hawkins Drive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just noticed a difference regarding environmentally sensitive areas marked out on the current environmental plan, uh, but not the, the draft. And also things such as deer wintering areas, provincial wetlands, local wetlands, etc. I just wondered what the reason was for that and if it had somehow been incorporated into different phraseology, uh, etc. Do you want me to take that, Wes? Uh, so through your worship to the, the resident, the uh, as part of the official plan review process, the we've obtained updated mapping layers from the MNRF. They're the folks that supply the natural heritage mapping layers to, uh, to the municipalities in the province. So we've refined the mapping based on the new layers that have been provided. So if there's a specific area in question that you're questioning that, that you're, you think that, well, there's certainly a feature here, it was identified in the old plan and it's not on the new plan, for example, then if you'd kindly point that out to us, we'd definitely take a specific look at that. But as far as the layers in general, it's the updated mapping layers that have been provided by the province that form the foundation of these documents. Thank you. Yes, I'll uh, I'll submit uh, a comment uh, later today then, because there's no wetlands defined on the the new schedules that I can see anyway. Thank you. Just to, if if I can, uh, Your Worship, just to be clear, um, what has been done in the new official plan is aggregate all, uh, aggregate all those 
separate environmental features uh, and functions into a single designation. So for example, uh, provincial wetlands, um, significant uh, PSWs, uh, regional and local wetlands, unclassified wetlands are all included within the natural heritage system um, that shows up on the schedules to the official plan. It would also include a fairly extensive list of other features and functions uh, that form part of that mapping that uh, Jamie identified that is provided uh, by the uh, province and has been refined uh, to some extent uh, by the County of Simcoe. And, and it's really that that forms the basis for the single land use designation, uh, which includes each and, one, and every one of those individual uh, environmental components. Did you have any other comments, Mr. Capitano? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to um, the next registered participant, which would be Suzanne Knight. I'm not seeing Suzanne in the waiting room. So perhaps I'll move on to the next participant. Um, so that is the group of the Mason Marie Works Council of Ontario. I'm not sure who from that group would like to speak, um, but feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks very much. It's uh, my name's uh, John Armstrong. And uh, as you as you said, I represent the uh, uh, Masonry Works Council of Ontario. Uh, we're the provincial association representing the brick block and stone uh, industry. Uh, we work with municipalities uh, throughout the province that are doing uh, OP reviews, secondary plans and urban design guidelines to uh, recommend language that uh, go into those plans that will encourage builders to build to a higher standard. Uh, so we've been, we've been, we've participated with over about 130 municipalities uh, over the course of the last half dozen years, uh, often uh, participating multiple times in, in those uh, in, in uh, through through those planning processes. Uh, so I just have a few comments uh, or, or, uh, about uh, about the plan that you might that you might want to consider. Uh, certainly uh, encouraging to uh, see that you're uh, that that you're recommending some use of architectural control. Uh, I think uh, you know one of, one of our uh, key components is is that you know really focusing on uh, the um, uh, that higher standard of of, uh, of the built form uh, as it relates uh, primarily to residential um, is really of course needless to say the from the masonry perspective a lot of that has to do with brick uh, from our perspective but not of course exclusively uh, so use of architectural control to to ensure that they that a uh, a builder or a developer is really paying attention to to the uh, uh, to the design uh, is uh, and, and the design of the built form is certainly important. Uh, we certainly encourage that use as it relates to uh, some of your your language is is uh, is is soft and provides a lot of provides a lot of latitude. We recommend that you might want to that you might want to strengthen that language up a little bit, particularly as it might relate to larger greenfield developments. Uh, perhaps some uh, some some infill uh, as well uh, that uh, and then at the same time uh, the architectural control uh, really needs to be grounded on um, uh, some good urban design guidelines. Again, we note in your plan that you that uh, you make some reference to to uh, to designing uh, or to or to uh, uh, do building urban design guidelines. Again, you've left it. Uh, you've left it pretty soft. Uh, we, we'd encourage you to, to be stronger in the in uh, in those that you are going to build those, and then reference those in 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 the OP. The simple reason uh, being that if there is a, a builder who wants to come to town and do a development that uh, that really doesn't meet the standards that uh, that that the town might expect, uh, then. Um, with, without some strong urban design guidelines reinforced with, uh, with your official plan, uh, you really don't have, uh, there isn't really a lot the town can do to, to, to stop that building. So uh, uh, so we encourage you to, to do the urban design guidelines, 
uh, and then to uh, and, and and that will then that that will then um, uh, help protect you. Uh, and then uh, uh, lastly, uh, the uh, as it relates to as it relates to climate change, uh, certainly uh, you've got some you've got some new pieces in the in the plan there. We also recommend that you do include the the uh, the uh, uh, the the, um, uh, the the envelope, the building envelope, which has a lot to do with the the uh, the the, uh, the wrap of the building or the facade of the building. After all. Uh, the Ontario Financial Accountability Office is estimating that precipitation is going to increase by like 18.2 percent by by 2080. Uh, so if people are building to uh, uh, minimum standards uh, uh, that are in place right now, we all know that those minimum standards are not going to be enough in the future. Uh, and uh, and and so recognizing that the kind of decisions that the town uh, is going to be making over the course of the next, you know, over the course of its mandate, um, are really hundred-year decisions as it relates to what that built form is going to be. Um, so really, to be mindful of that, and so we just really encourage you to pay attention to to the built form. And then lastly, the design guidelines. It's not just a focus on durability, but also just fo focus on design excellence and architectural excellence as well. So that way, the the, the new the the new develop developments that come into your municipality are things that you're really proud of and you really feel good of, about and that they're good strong additions to to uh, to your municipality and uh, with that I'll stop thank you very much thank you um, I'm not sure Wes or Jamie if you wanted to respond to that now or just take that as a comment um, at this time I don't think there's a need for a response at this time. We've, we've heard the comments, so we'll take that for consideration. Okay. Um, with that, I'll move on to the next participant, which would be Roger Miller, if they would like to unmute themselves. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Roger Miller. I'm with a firm called Miller Planning Services. And for the clerk's purposes, uh, my address is as follows. I'm at suite 404, 701 Roslyn Road East, Whitby, Ontario. The postal code is Larry One Nancy, 9K3. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor and members of council, we represent owners of a 12 acre piece of property known as 10394 Highway 11 South, which is in the settlement area of Lashago. And if council members wish to follow along, if you refer to schedule SA1, this property is located in the urban boundary of Lashago, west of Highway 11 and south of the railway, or if you will, to the left of the railway on the uh, the mapping. Um, as the schedule shows, this property is located within the urban boundary of Bushego and is identified as a settlement living area. Um, just for context, this property is also identified within the urban boundary of Bushego in your current official plan but it is designated as shoreline residential in that document. Um, we wanted to just share a few comments with uh, council this morning as it relates to the proposed official plan. We did attend the open house last week and provided comments. Uh, I believe a few members of council may have heard of our, our presentation at that time. And uh, we apologize if we're going to end up repeating ourselves for those, those members of council that did attend. Um, we, we outlined in our presentation that we have been involved in a couple of pre consultation meetings with township planning staff and are in the process of preparing planning applications for submission to the township. The development proposal would be for four shoreline residential lots with water access to the property. And we have reviewed the proposed official uh, plan in the context of our forthcoming development application. Um, we note, uh, as we noted earlier, that the proposal is to retain the lands within the urban boundary and to designate them as settlement living area. 
and uh, we believe that there's uh, also the imposition of a phasing policy, which is known, shown as a GA3 on the mapping. Our initial concerns related to the new wastewater and water policies found in sections 7.3 and 7.4 of the proposed official plan. And um, for purposes of our commentary this morning, um, though the policies are similar, we'll, we'll refer to the policies in 7.3. Uh, within 7.3, the policies address the wastewater and the provision of wastewater and suggest that there's a wastewater hierarchy where municipal wastewater servicing would be at the top of the hierarchy. Moving down, the wastewater servicing would consider uh, private communal servicing. And then thirdly, and lastly, individual on-site wastewater services. Seven Policy 7.3.2a provides a notwithstanding for settlement areas, including with Shago, that state that servicing, servicing shall be on municipal wastewater services and that they follow a certain sequencing, GA1 being first, GA2 being second, and GA3 being third. Um, policy 732B indicates that private servicing may be considered on existing lots of record and limited infill development situations. At the open notice, we question whether these new policies uh, would uh, impact our client's development proposal. And in such, would we be caught by 732A or would we be permitted to proceed with our development under 732B, um, potentially being considered as infill, infill uh, development? Um, if, if you considered or looked at the schedule that we referred to earlier, which is the proposed schedule SA1. Uh, council uh, uh, will note that our client's lands have some unique locational characteristics. We're separated from the other areas of Shago by Highway 11 and Railway, and the property is um, subject to superficial bedrock conditions. So we had asked staff whether the requirement for full municipal services would apply here under 732A and 742. And at this point, we've been communicating with the planning department to seek clar clarity on these new policies and how they will be applied to our clients' lands. Uh, we will continue to have dialogue with staff and file a written letter uh, to this process with our full comments. At this point, we believe that perhaps a site-specific policy should be provided in the OP, which would acknowledge the principle of development on these lands, but allowing that the lands be developed on private services. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of council, those are my comments at this point. We do, however, have a question and it's a procedural question. We'd like to know how the responses to written submissions will be handled. Will the written submissions be re responded to prior to the release of the recommendation report? And if the responses are to be included in a recommendation report, how many days in advance will that report be available to the public for review and consideration before committee or council looks at adopting a new official plan? Um, Mr. Mayor and members of council, those are my comments and questions. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Mayor, if I can just provide a, just a quick commentary. Uh, I think um, Mr. Miller has acknowledged has acknowledged that um, that he has had ongoing uh, conversations with the municipal staff um, and the municipal planning staff uh, have also had uh, discussions with us with respect to the particularly the, uh, the servicing policies for the settlement areas. Um, I, just to be clear that the, the proposed new official plan while it does contain the uh, servicing hierarchy that's set out in the PPS and in the growth plan um, and in the county official plan, for example, um, that it, uh, it does permit um, uh, the uh, use of individual private on-site services within settlement areas uh, subject through um, either applications or justification uh, to support the use of uh, individual uh, on-site uh, water and wastewater services. So it's, 
would be up to the uh, property owner and the applicant to provide that support and justification um, um, as part of their uh, planning application process. And the criteria for that consideration are set out in, in the case of wastewater section 735 of the official plan. We've been looking at it um, and uh, we look forward to receiving Mr. Miller's detailed comments and uh, further consideration with respect to uh, whether uh, you know, a site specific policy is appropriate in this case. Um, and sort of maybe the second, the question is uh, with respect to uh, um, how the responses to submissions will be made. Uh, I'm going to uh, um, uh, ask uh, Andrea or Allison if, if they want to respond to that. We typically prepare a, a report to council with a response matrix and the response matrix is a response to the comments and whether the requested changes or revisions or refinements to the official plan uh, are, are supported. And that report is a report to council. Um, you know, we, we don't report back to the uh, commenter, but it's a report to council, which is made public typically through the uh, public agenda process. Thank you, Mr. Crown. Ms. Woodrow, did you want to comment based on Mr. Crown's comments? Thank you, Mayor Burkett. Certainly through you uh, to Mr. Miller. Uh, so basically what happens is similar to the agenda package that was produced for today's meeting, uh, Mr. Crown and Mr. Robinson's report on the various submissions and the responses there too would be published as part of that agenda uh, the week prior to the meeting. Um, as following typical process. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Mr. Miller, did you have any other comments? Uh, no, I, I, I think my question has been addressed. And uh, again, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the next uh, participant, uh, which would be Wanda Minnings. I'm not sure if they're in the waiting room, but feel free to um, unmute yourself now. I'm not seeing any movement in the waiting room, so perhaps I'll move on to the next participant, um, which would be staff from Morgan Planning and Development. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, Mayor and members of Council and members of the public. Uh, my name is Victoria Lemieux, and I am a senior planner with Morgan Planning and Development. Uh, I am here this morning on behalf of the owners of 8675 Highway 12. Uh, we just wanted to make uh, some brief comments to, to Council and staff for consideration, and we will, of course, follow up um, with these in writing uh, to, to both staff and, and the clerk. Um, so don't don't feel the need to make any notes while I while I go on here. So uh, this property is located uh, for those who may not be familiar. It's located within the Bass Lake uh, Marchmont settlement area, uh, and is currently designated settlement employment. Uh, and the draft official plan, uh, based on uh, Schedule SA two, uh, does propose to maintain that settlement employment uh, designation. Uh, our office has been in discussion with the township. Uh, regarding this property since about 2014. Uh, at that time, uh, our office did request uh, to township staff uh, consideration to redesignate re uh, this parcel of land to a settlement living designation at the time that the official plan review process uh, was to was to occur. Uh, so essentially, um, you know, and, and, a, and an important point, I think both uh, on behalf of myself and uh, Josh Morgan that we want to make sure uh, Council is aware of is that our st our office uh, has been following the county MCR process closely um, and we definitely respect the challenges uh, that the Township Council and staff uh, face in regards to retaining these employment lands as uh, both Jamie and Wes mentioned throughout their presentation um, the importance of these lands for being able to 
uh, maintain and, and hopefully exceed uh, those projected needs that the township uh, has in the future. Uh, however, for a number of reasons, uh, it is our opinion that uh, this specific parcel of land uh, functionally is not usable as an employment use and would be better suited for potential future uh, low density residential development. Um, just briefly, uh, the reasons behind this, uh, number one is we have uh, obtained uh, an opinion from the MTO essentially advising that no access uh, will ever be possible from Highway 12 onto this property. Uh, number two is the lot size and configuration itself of the parcel of land. Uh, so essentially this parcel is 0.7 hectares in lot area and is quite shallow uh, if you uh, look at the online interactive mapping. Uh, so when you really take into consideration uh, MTO uh, development setback requirements, you're really left with not a very feasible uh, building envelope for a reasonable settlement employment use. Uh, and number three, the property itself is separated uh, by residential lots uh, located along the south of Alana Drive uh, from other larger parcels of settlement employment lands in this settlement uh, area. So therefore, because this property is physically separated and not directly adjacent to these larger parcels, uh, we also don't believe that there would be an opportunity in the future um, to, for instance, merge this smaller parcel with uh, a larger tract of land to allow for uh, more future uh, development uh, potential. So respectfully, we request that uh, Council and uh, staff consider this submission uh, and revise Schedule SA2 to redesignate the lands as settlement living. Uh, again, I will send these comments in, in writing, so thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Um, so I'll move on to the next participant. Um, so that would be Tom Morrissey. Okay, I'm not seeing any movement on the participants list, so I'll move on to the next. Um, that would be Margaret Ann Murray. Um, next would be Ian Newman. Following that is Warren Patterson. Following that is Omar Rivera. Hello. Can Hello. anybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak during this meeting. Thank you for the mayor, the council, and everybody present. Um, I just had a couple of points, uh, and I know that I'm new to this this uh, town planning uh, or planning session, uh, so I apologize if I overlap some of the things that may have been discussed in the previous uh, sessions. But a couple of uh, things that have come to mind. I'm I'm uh, just for the record, I'm a business owner in Mushego at three three nine five Muskoka Street. Uh, the proprietor of Scoops. Um, and I have a couple of questions that may um, uh, hopefully could be answered today or maybe in later sessions regarding a couple of items that I, I want to bring up. Um, one of them was, um, uh, is, are there going, or are there any plans within the, uh, the, the, the um, proposed plan uh, for any incentives for businesses to convert to renewable or resilient uh, materials or or any you know use of energy or better appliances or lighting fixtures or anything like that that may help ease some of the, the use of grid in the uh, or um, energy within the grid. Um, if so, if there's a way to communicate that to businesses, I think uh, uh, it might be a, um, something that could be proposed in the plan as far as we have a system in place or n not necessarily for incentives, but things that may help in, a, in, a, in ease some of the things uh, in the grid as well. So that was my first point. My second point was, I have three in total, by the way. My second point was um, um, seeing a lot of traffic coming through the Shago, I've noticed there's a sort of a lack of signage 
uh, within the area of uh, immediately surrounding any of the highways 169, 11, or anything like that, that that could impact the traffic flow and the available resources within our our, our small community uh, to local public passing through. I didn't know if that was plan part of the um, the actual uh, plan to increase visibility for people who are tourists who uh, businesses rely on quite heavily. So I didn't know if that was part of a situation that is a, an Ontario government plan or a municipality or a local uh, seven plan. Um, there's there's a lot of, uh, when you look, just driving up Highway 11, you can see a lot of different types of signages for different types of businesses. And when we contacted the Ontario government, we were told that it'd be a municipal, um, a possible municipal uh, um, fix to this as opposed to an Ontario because we didn't qualify because of the size of our business. Um, so I was wondering if that's a thing that could be addressed as part of the, the plan, how to enhance uh, local visibility for, for tourists. Uh, even marking trails and, and giving maps for people of what to do in the areas could be enhanced as well because we get a lot of conversations started in our shop, but what do I do now that I'm here? So, and I think that engagement with the tourist population will help all our municipalities, um, all, our, all, our, all within our municipality, sorry. Um, and, the, and the last was, um, I kind of, I'm a little confused about the designation of Washego as a, either a, a settlement, a historic site or something like that. Is there a possibility that we can have, I can have clarification or, or, or you know, a distinct signage that says you're entering a certain area or Shago is designated this. I think it kind of elevates um, our community a little bit, uh, not just to have township over Shago. If we are designated some historic value or if there's a historic value to the uh, area, I think I'd like to acknowledge that, not only just for us, but also for other people who helped build and, uh, the, and, and, and have gotten us to this place in Washago. Uh, now, I know when you go to Coldwater, you see a lot of, there's a lot of histories, a lot of events, there's a lot of things that are happening there, uh, and they seem to be very nicely addressed, but in Wichego, I don't know if we have, if anybody has, has brought that up before. So thank you very much for your time. I, I can send you an email with all my points or all my talking points if you'd like, but I also want to know if there was any feedback I can get on the record today as far as, especially the, the signage of the area, like, I. I know we have a Wushego sign, but we don't have what businesses are there or what's available to the public as people are getting close to the municipality. I mean, I don't I don't want to pull saddle and truck on the side of the highway. That's not what I'm after. But is there a little bit that says, hey, a couple of businesses are coming up. Maybe you guys could slow down and, and help us out here kind of deal. And is that a municipal thing? Worship, why, why don't I go very quickly and uh... Um, try to respond to Mr. Rivera's uh, questions. Um, with respect to the first around incentives, uh, um, uh, the municipality is generally uh, not permitted uh, to provide incentives um, for development or specific types of development, save and except with respect to a specific and unique tool under the Planning Act, which is called uh, community improvement plan. Uh, the uh, draft of the OP would permit the municipality to consider uh, using that tool. Um, likely, uh, if the municipality wants to uh, put that tool on it, its permissive tools list in the official plan, we probably need to uh, um, expand that section of the OP a little bit to provide guidance about when and how and and if it should use the community improvement plan uh, but it's uh, generally something that the municipality uses uh, to improve the public realm so uh, roads streets sidewalks and the facades of buildings or structures um, is generally the focus of cips um, and it's uh, it's a tool that the municipality could consider with respect to signage, please submit your comments to the municipality. They're really not um, uh, uh, specifically addressed 
in the official plan other than uh, the municipal giving the municipality permissive authority to pass a sign bylaw but uh, the types of things that you're talking about like wayfinding uh, community identification is probably a conversation you should have directly with the uh, municipality in particular the public works department um, and Washago is a settlement area in the official plan uh, but the the designation of uh, Wishago as a settlement area in the official plan is for planning purposes um, and it's to guide and direct the form and nature of development in Wishago. Uh, we don't deal with whether it's a, uh, a historic or not uh, settlement area um, and again that may be something that should form part of your comments uh, to the municipality particularly around signage and wayfinding uh, signage for the uh, for Wishago. We look forward to uh, getting your comments, Mr. Rivera. Thank you. Thank you for the reply. Uh, can I ask one more question, uh, if, if possible? I'm mm -hmm. um, just wondering if, if there are any energy audits or, or energy assessments that, the, that uh, can be provided to residences or businesses through the municipality. Uh, so that way, uh, I understand the incentive packages might not be, you know, within this purview. But can we, or are there uh, a way that we can build in a cost to uh, assessments of, of efficiency for certain businesses uh, as part of this plan going forward? Because part of the plan, from my understanding, is to be more energy efficient. Correct. I didn't know if that was a, a something. A, if we can even do that, would it help businesses and, and easing some pressure on the grid? So the qu quick answer, um, if I can, uh, uh, Mayor Burkett, um, generally uh, the province um, and or the uh, local uh, hydro authority um, are the jurisdictions that would provide those types of uh, incentives. So, you know, please look to uh, Hydro One and or the province. Um, it is uh, something that the municipality could consider through a CIP, um, but it, it, it you know that's a, a decision for the municipality down the road. Madam Clerk, uh, is this an opportunity to speak, or should we wait until afterwards for Mr. Rivera? If I had a comment for him. Um, sorry, my internet crashed there for a minute, um, but I believe you're welcome to speak. Um, I might just say for Mr. Rivera that in most instances, it's hydro or the province that does provide energy subsidies um, and energy assessments and retrofits that you can apply for. Um, at one point, I do think the federal government as well had a um, energy assessment program where you could have your building assessed. And then if you undertook the respective retrofits, you would qualify for a tax deduction on your next taxes. So um, maybe a few things there that you could look into as well that are existing programs. Thank you. So Mr. Romero, thank you for uh, logging on. We do belong to Lake Country, which uh, uh, does promote our township. You can go on their website and look at, at what they uh, promote. As far as signage, we do have a sign committee. And of course, you can, you can uh, send a, a letter to mayor and council and we can look at that. As far as cold water, they have their own BIA and I know that Wachego does not. So the BIA in, in cold water is something that they as a group lobby the local businesses. And I think at one point they were looking at a possible BIA in, in Wachego, but uh, nothing happened. Hope that that answers some of your questions. Thank you very much, Mayor. Deputy That's Mayor John Lobby. Thank you. I want to uh, answer one of his questions too, Mr. Rivera. Uh, Simcoe County Tourism Business have grants. So if you get a hold of them, Simcoe County, and it's under Tourism Business Grants, that may be something that you would be able to apply for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Cox. Just to go back to what uh, uh, the Mr. Mayor Burkett said through the chair, um, the Lake Country and Simcoe Tourism have maps and booklets that they will give you so you can have them in your business to hand out to people. 
So there's contact, maybe you could contact uh, the township. I'm not sure if it would be Allison or Tracy and they could give you a contact name so you would have that information. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much for the input. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Rivera? No, that was good. Thank you very much. And I will uh, send this through email as well so we can have it on record. Thank you. Thank you. Emily? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. It looks like uh, Madam CAO has her hand up, um, so I'm not okay. sure if she wanted to speak to something. Can't see her. Madam CAO. Uh, hi there. Sorry, Your Worship. Through you, just to, to clarify, we don't have a signed committee, but we do have a signed implementation plan. And I'm sorry I missed the gentleman's name, but I'm sure uh, Allison or Emily caught it, and uh, we will make sure that he gets the signed implementation plan after this. Thank you. Mr. Rivera was his name. Thank you. Okay, Thank Emily. You. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the next registered participant is Neil Schinder. I'll just give a second in case anyone's trying to unmute here. Um, so if not, um, the next participant is Dan Stone. Okay. Um, if not, um, we can move on to Marilyn Elaine Thompson. Um, and if not, uh, Rick Wernick. Um, if no one else would, uh, if no one's trying to unmute their mic, that would be all of the participants who registered in advance, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Emily. Wait a sec to see if anyone is going to unmute. No? Okay. Thank you to all those who spoke for your interest in the new official plan. If you did not get a chance to speak or would like to provide written comments, you are reminded that they still can be submitted in the form of an email or a letter mailed or dropped off to the township's offices by Wednesday, October the 5th, 2022. There's also a drop box out front if you wanna come on the weekend. Okay, we'll move on to members of the committee that have comments or questions. Deputy Mayor Dunlop. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I really like John Armstrong's comments about uh, building strong urban sites. It was, I found that really interesting. And especially when he talked about climate change. So whatever you're putting on the exterior of your house, your building needs to be strong enough for our climate change as we're seeing the flooding that's happening in the States. Storms like we've never seen before. Um, so the growth strategy section 11.6 and 6.4 you talked about building on rural sites. What, what lenience has been given to farmers that have fields that are untillable? Like, I mean, you can't even pass your cow on that. What, what's been given there for this type of uh, lots? We're looking for lots. There's, there's lots of farmers without cropping of stone and they, they make beautiful residential sites. What's been given there at West or Jamie, whoever can answer that for me, please. So well, I'm doing two things at once. Uh, uh, your worship, I'll, I'll respond to uh, uh, the, the deputy mayor. Um, the official plan, of course, um, and the preparation of the official plan um, is guided by a whole series of documents um, and legislation that we're obligated 
to either be consistent with uh, or, or conform to. And uh, as much as uh, we might like to uh, have free reign, we're, we're guided in the uh, preparation of the official plan by the Planning Act, by the PPS, uh, by the growth plan, and by the county official plan. And uh, each of those documents uh, provides a sort of limited ability um, and limited policy support for the creation of new lots, certainly in agricultural areas, of course, but even in um, uh, even in rural areas, which are, I think, as Jamie had indicated earlier, are the marginal agricultural lands that aren't classes one, two, and three, and aren't sort of prime uh, agricultural uh, lands. So what we've done in the official plan, though, is provide in the rural designation um, a policy framework um, within the frameworks of those larger uh, upper tier documents, um, an opportunity to create uh, new rural residential lots where they meet uh, those limited um, uh, those limited uh, criteria. I will say, um, and I'm going to try to find that section in a, in a second, and maybe I'll, I'll turn it over for Jamie. I'll know he'll want to comment on this as well, so I can find that section for the deputy mayor. Um, we don't yet know what the county's response to this is going to be. Um, uh, we believe that we're still uh, in conformity and consistent with the upper plans, while at the same time providing some more flexibility. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna see what the county's comments uh, on the plan when they uh, submit it uh, to the municipality. Jamie, I'm sure you want to add some additional uh, color. And while I particularly find uh, the, the specific section in, in 11.7 of the official plan, uh, all I wanted to add in addition to what Wes has said is that uh, the province, like. The deputy mayor has provided some examples of poor farmland and the inability to use it for agricultural purposes or valuable value valuable agricultural purposes i'll say so and should there be other land use i think the what she's getting at is other land uses should be permitted on those lands and potentially residential uses if it's compatible with and doesn't take away from the overall farming operation so Firstly, the way agricultural lands are are identified in the province, there's a number of mechanisms, but soil classification is one of those. And soils are classified from organic, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, I think seven is the end of it. So those lands that Ms. Dunlop's speaking about would be like this sort of class seven lands, which generally aren't considered agricultural lands. So <clears throat> if somebody's aware of, a, of their property or they know their property has been incorrectly identified as agricultural or prime agricultural lands, then this is the process and this is the form to let us know about that. We've tried to go through and identify those properties and take them out of the agricultural designation and move them to a rural designation. But we need to rely on 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 local knowledge as well to, to help assist with those and provide those comments. So um, we what I can what I can offer is that in the rural designation we have allowed for so those lands that are on the fence or moved into the rural designation, if they're in the rural designation, we have allowed we have been as flexible as we can be with respect to the law creation policies or as permissive as we can be while still conforming to the county official plan. I think I tried to really make that clear in the earlier presentation. But we've also added permissions for additional land uses in rural areas, provided you're compatible with the rural area, provided you do not negatively impact natural heritage features and those sorts of things. So, so we've really tried to focus on providing categories of uses that could be established and not being really specific in rural areas, but providing and opening the door where that compatibility test is met that folks could establish additional uses. And so, from the residential <clears throat> perspective, we're really, we've been as, we believe as permissive as we can be in the development of the document. 
Okay, so further to that, Jamie or Wes, going forward, if um, a farmer has not seen this official plan, we're looking for lots. Um, families are trying to help their their own children out, and they they think, well, let's go and apply. There's scruff land up on the up on the side road. There's no development. Like we don't have to create. We as a township wouldn't have to create more roads or anything. They're there. Could they, if they're late to the table on this, can they apply anyway? Like say a year from now. Maybe that- I'll just take that one. So um, they can always apply. Anyone can apply at any point in time. The chances of then the likelihood of success would be limited because of the policy framework that's in place. And what I will say, though, is that these documents aren't static documents. They're subject to review every five or ten years, as the case may be, and the municipality can open them up at any time. What has changed is the provincial policy statement got a little bit more flexible in 2020 when it was updated. And the, the way it got more flexible is it used to use language that said limited residential development is permitted in rural areas. It took out the word limited in 2020 and it included locally appropriate development, residential development is permitted in rural areas with no definition of what locally appropriate is. Now the county has not updated their official plan since the PPS in 2020 was updated to define for us what locally appropriate is in the context of Simcoe County and the lower tier municipalities. So there, I don't wanna say the door is completely shut, but there is an opportunity through the a potential update of the county official plan in the future to see some um, some expanded rural law creation permissions, which then could be up implemented through the local documents. I can't guarantee that's going to happen, but there is a change in land use in language that has occurred, with no subsequent change at the at the county level. So, and again, the county does not have to wait for a county official uh, county OP update to implement changes. If county council saw a desire to do a site spe- or to do a spe- to do a special study to deal with law creation policies, for example, county council could direct staff to undertake that exercise and update and look to update those policies. But it's um, we have a big brother here, fortunately or unfortunately, and we have to conform with their policies. And there's a process to to go through. So it's really it. it could be a matter of timing and, and just that's sort of the realm where we exist right now but the the rules could could change can't guarantee they will but they could okay thanks for that long short sorry answer. for being so long <laughs> it's but okay. it's a and, complicated matter yeah and deputy mayor if you want to look at uh section 1173 e of the uh draft official plan the proposed official plan it sets out the seven criteria for the consideration of lot creation within the rural designation. So that's where, like Jamie said, we're trying to uh, balance uh, the permissions that are in the PPS with the policies that are in the the county uh, official plan. Um, We think we've got it right. um, And we we think that it's uh, defensible from a planning perspective as well. Um, and, and, and time will tell um, as we go through the balance of this process. Okay, thank you. I've got one more question right now and then I can come back. Um, you had Carlian Road between Division and Brody marked as a haul route. So, uh, again, uh, Your Worship, uh, through to uh, the deputy mayor um, will confirm that. I, just so you know, we've been uh, refining Schedule E based on the transportation master plan. Uh, I know we updated it uh, in the past couple of days, um, have provided it uh, to the municipality for review. I understand you've had some uh, a busy uh, past couple of days with meetings. And so we'll, we'll review and confirm that. The intent is, is that the Schedule E will be consistent with the transportation master plan 
um, and to show the haul routes as set out in the transportation master plan. Yes, yeah, so it was on your map, just, just to, I want to make sure I know that it, if it is or not, it was on your map shown as green. Now that's going to be uh, looked at next year because of the new bridge at Burnside. There's going to be a bike, tra a cycling trail come off that bridge. It's going to go across Brody and down Carlion to division. And that's going to catch the trail over there. I hope we're not mixing aggregate trucks in with cyclists. That makes me real nervous. Uh, noted and we'll review with uh, staff, both planning and public works. Okay, thank you very much. And 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 the other thing, that's a, uh, there's a lot of population in there. There's a trailer park with probably over a hundred plus the, uh, there's two little subdivisions in there, Ryerson and Clearview. So it's, it's a well populated short section of road that I'm very nervous about. Thank you. So I'll leave, I've got other questions, but I'll leave it open to the council to carry on or committee. Any other members of council? Councillor Taylor. I have a couple of questions and a comment. Um, on your mapping for waste disposal sites, it's the same, same shade for old sites as well as current sites. Uh, for example, the one on Irish Line, it hasn't been used for way over 50 years and it's a huge uh, uh, footprint there. I just wonder what the status of that is and is that forever or uh, what's the story on that? If Amy or Wes could answer that question. You want me to take it or you want to take sure. it? Uh, you can yeah, start, Jamie, if you want. Um, so we, from a policy perspective and a land use perspective, whether they're active or inactive, it's the same same policies and, and considerations for a D4 study that applies. If if that's something you'd like us to do is have a different notation on them so you, you know what's active and not active, we can, we can, can look at modifying that. Uh, with respect, what is important, I think, is the area of influence that's identified around a waste management site is the way that gets implemented is ultimately through a holding symbol in the zoning bylaw. So basically everything within, I think it's the 500 meters, if I'm not mistaken, around the waste disposal site gets placed in a holding zone. And, and how that affects potential residents or property owners is that they're not able to construct a building or potentially expansion to a building without doing a study to demonstrate that there's no potential leachate in the area or that the property can be appropriately serviced with a well. So that area of influence could be removed if a D4 study is completed on that particular waste disposal site to indicate that there's no potential future impact of leachate or impact on surrounding property owners. I, I've had experience of that. So the county has done that in some of their former waste disposal sites. I know the District of Muskoka, there is sort of small waste disposal sites littered across cottage country on, on lakes all over the place. And they've gone in and done these studies and removed those those assessment areas. So it's something that could happen uh, and, and those areas could be removed. But I, I might have gone a little over your question, but I wanted to provide the context and how it would affect residents. Yeah, well, just a quick question to the chair, to Jamie, just that that's a huge uh, footprint on something that I, I've been living in the area my whole life and I've, I've never seen seen that site. So uh, just a comment out there. But the second one I've got is your implementation tool for tree conservation. Uh, we're getting a lot of pressure from shoreline development and uh, neighboring property owners concerned about tree cutting bylaws and can this work by itself or do we still have to get a tree cutting bylaw in to, to uh, preserve our shoreline in the future? So I'm hoping that does one supplement the other or do you need both uh, to, to save our shorelines? Very quickly if I could, uh, uh, I'll, I'll respond Jamie and uh, thank you uh, um, Mayor Burkett. Uh, Councillor Taylor, uh, the uh, policies in 1748 of the 
um, new official plan are permissive. So they would allow the municipality to consider uh, passing a bylaw uh, under the Municipal Act with respect to tree conservation. Um, and uh, council can choose to apply it across the entire municipality or apply it to specific areas of the municipality, um, uh, like the shoreline. Um, so it's really a, a permissive authority that would let council determine how it wants to proceed and if it wants to proceed with the tree cutting by law. I can tell you I uh, um, was working for a uh, Muskoka Cottage Country municipality that proposed a tree cutting uh, bylaw and they had to hold the public meeting in the uh, municipal arena because there were 400 people out there uh, that came out and at the end of the day the municipality tailored the bylaw uh, specifically to the shoreline areas of the municipality so uh, it's something for the municipality to consider what we've done in the OP is provide the permissive authority to allow you to do it. So through, through the, the chair, then you're saying that we still need a bylaw to to get this done. Then correct. Okay, thank you. And the, the last is a comment. Uh, um, our next meeting to go over the uh, our uh, this plan discussion is next Wednesday. Today's Thursday. Uh, what's a realistic timetable that? The, uh, the general public can get their comments in and a realistic time for consultant for you, the consultants and our staff to review and yet we're meeting on Wednesday. Is that, are we being realistic here or do we have to expand that uh, date to review the uh, uh, questions and comments from public and, and council? So the, the, the date, October 5th, which I believe is next Wednesday, is the deadline for the submission of comments. Um, and uh, we've uh, committed to working with staff to, uh, once we've received those, to re review and provide a report and response to all the comments that have been submitted um, for either the November 2nd or the November 14th meeting. Yeah, like uh, normally before the... Uh... Uh, any council meetings or uh, council meetings, we uh, have a, a week's notice to review the agenda. That's all, and it's not going to make make the week's uh, notice uh, time frame. Thank you, Madam CAO. Thank you. I think maybe Councillor Taylor misheard what Wes said. It is not on next Wednesday Wednesday's agenda. The agenda, the deadline for public comments is next Wednesday. It will come before council in November. So, and you will get your weeks. Uh, agenda just like you always do. Thank you. That's all for now. Thank you. Any further comments? Councillor Cox. Um, through the chair to, I think, Wes, I had uh, a resident come to me and I sent you a letter about it that Katie and I had talked about and that was severing lots in settlement areas where there was no possible chance of water and sewer ever coming and would it be possible to have it i i've dug through <laughs> i've dug through this and i found it in seven and i found it in the water and the wastewater and i've seen it in other ones but there's no clarity you have to go to about five little different places to see actually it, it, there's no clarity that says in the future, we will look at uh, lots that are in settlement areas to be able to sever them because we know that the water and sewer will never come to them within 25 years or something. And so there sit these people with these lots and they're told that they can't do it. And I thought for sure that we would have made it a little more clear so that you don't have to go through section seven and then the settlement area and what you would like and the wastewater and the, the the water. So is there not a possibility that that should be something that's in the settlement section that says there is a chance if there is no chance because these people have been sitting waiting to sever these lots for years and have been told to do it. And it's not like it's, it's, it, it's an infill. It fills right in where everybody else is it's, and they are in the settlement area. 
Um, if I can, uh, Mayor Burkett, uh, through to Councillor uh, Cox, thank you. I, I remember that uh, those comments. Um, and, you know, we'll take a look at the uh, servicing hierarchy and the servicing policies for the settlement areas to see whether there's a way to make them clear. Uh, the, the policy framework, I believe, is there that would permit um, uh, private servicing where, uh, you know, the feasibility of providing uh, full municipal services um, is not there. We think the policy framework is there, but we'll take a look at it and see if we can uh, if there's ways to improve it and make it clear. Yeah, it, it's just not in the settlement part. You have to kind of dig through things to find it. The other one I, I had a concern, again, a question about is um, it's on page 544 and it's the um, shoreline communities and it's uh, 5.63 and 5.64. It says about new development and they shall require natural vegetation preservation enhancement in front on uh, or waterside yards and then the next one says hardscaping and non-native hard landscaping in front or waterside yards should be discouraged i think this sort of also baits back to what um councillor taylor was talking about the the, the almost I don't clearly say like one says you have to do the vegetation but then it says the other one will be discouraged why can't you just say it's not allowed but you know where i'm going with this it, it, it's vague and and the this is where we're getting into trouble or concerns from different cottages like shoreline community people is that people are cutting right down to the waterfront they're putting their lawns right down they're doing all those kinds of things that is not good for the uh, shoreline and it causes erosion so i just thought it, it, they just kind of did this nothing was very clear no. No, but that, uh, through to councillor cox we'll, we'll take a look at uh um, at, at those policies and have made note of them. Um, just remember that the official plan is one part of a yeah. suite of tools that the municipality can make avail, uh, you know, avail itself of to regulate and control shoreline development. Right. Um, if you want to see how far you can go, uh, go to Muskoka. Right. Um, and uh, I can tell you that in Muskoka, um, every single tool that's available under the uh, Municipal Act and the Planning Act to regulate development along the shoreline is in place, um, including a lighting bylaw under the Municipal Act, which controls the nature and the form and the type of lighting and dark sky compliance that you're required for not only new lighting, but existing lighting as well. Uh, individual uh, building permits for a new a cottage or a waterfront property or an expansion to one requires site plan approval in many of the municipalities. So there's a range of tools that you can use and it depends on how uh, how rigorous you want to make your planning process um, in, the, uh, in the township of Severn. Well, and just the chair is that, but we're getting cottages now that are like 7,000, 8,000 square feet and before that never mattered, before people just had a cottage. And now this is where I am very sure that many cottagers out there are concerned about what is happening to the shorelines. Anyway, that thank you for that. And I just have one more. That was back to um, the um, getting lots from agricultural rural. And you did say that we could petition, because my thing was, why couldn't we just petition the um, county to maybe be more lenient? And you did say that, Jamie, that we could, the county council could look at that because they hadn't updated. So that, I was glad about that because there's quite a few people out there who are looking for that. Anyway, anybody else may, I'll have more comments later. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Yes. I would like to comment. Oh, Councillor Brennan, I didn't see your hand in the corner. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a number of points I want to make. I think I want to just make them in quick succession to be uh, less painful. Um, first of all, I want to say that, uh, well, 172 pages, that's a lot of stuff to get through. I can't imagine trying to write that. But anyway, well done by the planning team and the consultants that are involved. Um, having said that, there's a lot of things that uh, are worthy of further thought. First of all, Section 5.1 on housing choices. Um, 
I don't really see in there how we are going to accommodate affordable housing. Um, we talk about in section 541 that uh, the county has 10% affordable housing as a goal. I don't see anything in there that says how we're going to get our 10%. Uh, I think we need to define affordable housing in that section and I think we need a little more of a strategy. And I know we can always say, you know, there are other ways and documents to do that. But my experience over the years is if it isn't in the official plan, someone is going to say, well, it's not in the official plan. And then 25 years from now, we'll change it. Too late. Um, I imagine section 11.10.3 on aggregates where it says in section C, there is no need for the aggregate industry to demonstrate a need for aggregates. I find this astounding. Anyway, I'm pretty sure you are forced to put that in there by the province because I know the province renegotiated some really unhealthy deals for Ontarians early in their mandate and would not listen to anyone else on the topic. And these are some of the things that are going to cause us grief in our planning future. The um, related to that in section 11.15.2 in the secondary plan area, we talk about how it's sort of special and that we're going to have low density uh, development because uh, as a special precaution. There are, from what I saw on the map, aggregate areas in, in that group. We should have something in there that says we won't go below the water table in that area either. In other words, we're worried about housing on the top, but we can drill the living daylights out of the ground? Makes no sense to me. Um, in the section on source water protection, there's really nothing on the protection of private wells in Severn Township. What is that, 80% of the houses in, in Severn Township have private wells? And with that aggregate thing that we have going, we have no comments about the importance of protecting private well sources? I think that's a shortfall. Section 1311, 70% of the land base is in the natural heritage. We are so fortunate to have that. But the issue we have with natural heritage protection is in the areas where we are developing, in the subwater systems, and we need to protect, for instance, the temperatures of Silver Creek, North Creek, and others from development because we're losing, and the inch farm situation and north of there right now is 100% evidence of that. Lots, it's been well written up in the local papers. We need to watch the temperatures. We need buffers on our critical streams and there should be a comment about buffers on fisheries, not just protecting fisheries, because it didn't work down between Burnside and Utah. And we're, we've lost fisheries, trout fisheries on the south tributary, and that new development is going to lose the fisheries on the north tributary of Silver Creek. And that has been documented by an expert. So um, we need to add comments on the protection of wells. In a rehab of agricultural areas, I want to point out that one of the toughest things in the world is to rehab aggregate areas with trees. If you go to your county forests, you'll see it where they bought some of those areas. It's a tough, tough job. And if they're going to do rehab to aquatic areas and they're going to do forest cover rehab, hab, I'm going to suggest that we need financial assurance in place to ensure that what gets done stays done. The rehab of aquatic areas has a very poor record, and in most cases, it hasn't worked. And anyone who works in that science area will tell you that. So we need a little more protection there. MZOs weren't mentioned in there. I'd like to point out that that is an authoritarian tool that shouldn't be used in good planning, and that I would like to see a comment in there that says we would only use MZOs in the case because the, the, the province is saying we'll only do them now if we get a recommendation from the township. Well, I would like in our township plan for us to say, you will never see that only for extreme emergencies where there's absolutely no other alternative. We should stay on track and do our planning the way it's supposed to be done with public consultation. Um, what else? I'm almost there and then I'll shut up. In section 15.2.2, corporate energy revolving fund? Why are we doing that? 
we're going to we're considering having a corporate energy revolving fund to finance corporate energy retrofit projects. I don't know where that's come from, and I don't know why corporations or other people are going to benefit from things like that. I think that should be taken out. The um, we all know that the current Ontario government is hostile to climate action. Their own lawyers this week are quoted as saying the current climate action plan for Ontario is not worth the paper it's written on. So when we say we're going to integrate, as we do in section 15.3.4, the provincial policy recommendations for GHSs and so forth, I would like to see us say that we will go with current science and knowledge as best as we can to deal with climate change. It is a crisis. It's an emergency. I think we need to say something like that. It's very well known by anybody who knows anything about this business that it will take all three levels of government to beat this crisis down. And so we need that as a counterbalance. On natural heritage, I would like to see us say, and this is getting into section 1625, that we will endeavor to determine the value of the environmental services that are provided by our natural heritage and wetlands. If those, those who are at AMO saw some of the presentations on this, there are new tools out there to do these evaluations. And we need this kind of comment to counter the complete bias that's in there with regard to aggregate development. Because if we can't talk dollars, they're gonna beat us every time, the whole place will be plowed under. And that's my comment. Okay, Mr. Councilor Brennan, would you like an answer or you just want to have comments? Thank you. Just comments? I, I don't know if there's any, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff there, right? I, I don't expect immediate answers to all these things. Okay. Yeah, if I may, Your Worship. Yes, um, Mr. Robinson. I've been taking notes as I'm sure Mr. Crown has too, but if the councillor has his own notes that he'd like to provide to us that would also be helpful to make sure we've captured the comments appropriately and then we can take all those matter comments into consideration as we work through the final draft of the document but i don't like i don't there's a lot there as you mentioned i'm not sure we're ready to start answering questions right now i'd rather take a good hard look at them and, and come up with well thought out developed responses or modifications as required thank you Okay, any further comments? Okay, so I, I do have one on page uh, 196, section 16.2.5. And I understand wholeheartedly that the, the province dictates that we have to provide in our OP aggregate areas. My struggle is when it says here, some of the lands identified as aggregate aggregate potential are also designated natural heritage. So I know that we, we've had an application, a planning application where a resident wanted to build something and unfortunately was unable to build it because of the natural heritage mapping on it. So how does a quarry, if it's designated natural her heritage, how does it place back those lands the same way that they were before they started to extract rock or am I confused in the writing of this? Do you want me to take this Wes or you want me, I'll start and you can provide some color commentary. That'd be great. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you worship for the comment. And it's a, it's a question that I think a lot of folks have. Um, so I'll start off by saying each circumstance is unique and has a unique set of circumstances related to environmental considerations. Uh, in terms of the policies that have included in the official plan, uh, they really reflect what's provided uh, through the provincial policy statement and the growth plan and then also through the county official plan. When it comes to um, when it comes to comparing aggregate resources to other land uses, it's a difficult comparison because aggregate resources have a special set of policies or a unique set of policies in the provincial policy statement that apply to them. And in some instances, the, the, the rules or policies that apply to natural heritage, not, not, that apply to aggregates uh, and natural heritage features 
are different. They, they're considered differently when applied to natural or when applied to aggregate extraction operations than when applied to other land uses. That's just that's the way the provincial policy framework is established that we work under. So with, if you're trying to make the inference that there's a different set of rules for aggregates when it comes to protecting environmental features that there is for other things, you're not wrong in that. There are a different set of rules. However, there is still provincial permitting that's required through the, the various provincial agencies. There is uh, requirements if there's proposed uh, damage to species at risk habitat. For example, there's things like compensation that are required. There's things like net improvements that are required. But you are correct in, in I think, inferring that there's a different set of rules that potentially applies to this this unique land use compared to other land uses. So uh, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but um, each, each application is considered on its own. We've done our best through this official plan to mirror and follow the, the policy framework down from the province that provides for as much protection as we can to natural heritage features within that sort of policy context that the province dictates we have to follow. So, Thank you, Jamie. And, I, and that's exactly the way I, I'm reading it. So it, they do abide by a different set of rules only because the PPS dictates that and it's really out of our control. It's unfortunate because the ones that suffer are residents. We have no control over this. But if we go to section 16.3.6, which is on page 200, and if and when a quarry applies for a permit, do we, like it says here that we will construct to an appropriate standard for truck traffic. Is there something that we can put in the OP that if, if we really, if they abide by a different set of rules, why should we as a township and, and our taxpayers have to construct roads that will carry their heavy equipment? We're the ones that are gaining by this. Not, not we as a township. Is there something that we could add to uh, what you've written here? Um, we can certainly take a look at it. There is a requirement. So there's, it, it's a bit of a complicated answer, but we can certainly take a look at that to, uh, based okay. on your comment. But uh, in the consideration of applications, whether it's aggregate or other, if there's additional demands placed on, an, on infrastructure, there there can be a requirement for improvements to that infrastructure at the cost of the developers. It doesn't just apply to aggregates. And that gets implemented not only through the municipal process, but also through the, the site plan process that these applications are required to undergo under the Aggregate Resources Act that's implemented by, by the province. Uh, and then there's also, uh, there's also levies that, that apply that that the township gets funds to help with those haul routes and, and maintain those roads too. But uh, but we'll certainly look at, at your comment and your suggestion and see if, if there's anything we can do to bolster the, the policies around that point. All right, thank you. Further to your comments, we do get uh, a certain amount per, per tone, but when you compare that, I think we, like last year, we got 375,000. We have Nelson's quarry that's on Birdside and the road is now in need of being resurfaced, resurfaced but it, it's going to be into the millions. So it, it doesn't comp, the compensation isn't there for the wear and tear on the road. Just one other thing. And I know that the master transportation plan dictates some of the roads that will have continuity. And I haven't seen the master transportation plan and your map, I'm sorry, the map here doesn't really show. And I'll just, if, if you could just maybe write these ones down that, that I struggle with and that I'm not in favor of, I, I'd like to have them looked at and maybe brought back and maybe if council would consider maybe removing them. So the first one is, is the continue or the link between Thompson Crescent and Minoki Beach. Second one is Hawkins and Cox. And somewhere, one of the residents, and I uh, I couldn't find this, but someone had said that South Sparrow Lake Road was going to be from Cambrian to Highway 11, 
was going to be a, a designated haul route, but I find that hard to believe. But if we can just confirm that it will never be a haul route. And we also have Wood Avenue and uh, is it Bayou Road, Ron, that, uh, is it Bayou Road? No. Amigo. Amigo. Oh, Amigo. Wood, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Amigo to Wood. And there's going Wood to be to a Thompson. bridge. No, that's down at Thompson and, and, and Minoki, but there's a bridge, a possible bridge in the master transportation plan that uh, would have to be constructed over a canal, which uh, I uh, struggle with as well. And I can't find them like your your map on, on E. It does, it's not large enough to show those connections. Like I don't see them. I think it was Schedule E, was it not? Uh, what's that? Right. Yeah. It's, it's too small. The map's too small to see if there is any, any connections there. <clears throat> we, we've made notes, uh, Your Worship. Uh, we'll take a look at those and we'll work with uh, your planning staff and public works staff on the relationship between uh, the OP and the uh, transportation master plan. We'll look specifically at, at the hall routes as part of that. Um, I know, uh, yeah, we've, we've been updating it and we'll make sure that you get the updated uh, schedule um, and we'll specifically in the report uh, identify where are those changes that have been made. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> any comments, anyone else have any comments? Oh, sorry. Councillor Cox. Yeah, through the chair to uh, Jamie and Wes. Thank you very much. This was this was great and uh, very clear. And I know there's some changes that people like to see, but we've, we've got a good start on this. And uh, thank you very much. Hey, is is that uh, that's it? Okay. I just want to echo those. Oh, Deputy Mayor Don Dunlop, go ahead. Um, through um, the mayor. So. Anything that we have between now and, and October, the, the next meeting, we can just have people submit it, drop it off at the township, right? Okay, that's, I just, Allison's shaking. Alternatively, they can email me. Okay, great, thanks so and much. And I'll make sure that they are passed along to um, planning Wes and Jamie. Yeah, because after today, there's some people that need to be notified that haven't, that don't know about the official plan. So thank you very much. Do we do the same with our comments then? Your, if you have them, please do yep. feel free to flip them to me, Councillor Brennan, and I'll make sure that uh, Wes and Jamie and uh, the director receive them. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so both to you, Jamie and Wes, thank you very much for this uh, quite an in-depth document. Just wanna echo Councillor Cox's comments. Well done and, and thank you so much. I know it's been a long time and uh, Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. We'd just like to thank you, but also thank your staff. They've done a fantastic job and have been a huge, huge help to us. So don't want to make sure that doesn't go unnoticed on, on your end. Uh, excuse me. I should have said that. Department. You're absolutely right. And without them, we wouldn't have the document that we have because they would have guided you through this. So my apologies for not including staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so, you. And with that, Your Worship, I believe I just have a motion to wrap up the public meeting. Okay, Madam Clerk. I thank you. So the motion reads that planning report number P22-036 dated September 29th, 2022. With respect to the draft new official plan for the Township of Severn be received. And further that MHBC and planning staff be directed to review all comments received up to October 5th and report back to council with the next steps in approvals process in consultation with the County of Simcoe as the approval authority. Mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Brandon, second by Councillor Cox. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Correspondence, D1 point, point. Are we gonna pull one, Madam Clerk, or are we just gonna go one by one? Uh, no, uh, Your Worship, that concludes the public meeting completely. So we move on to just section E of the agenda, which is presentations and delegations and move forward. The 
Um, correspondence that was submitted with the public meeting, as with every public meeting, will be summarized in the minutes. Okay. So we're... You're at section E on your agenda. I was gonna say we did that presentations delegation, so we have none. Consent agenda, none. Adoption of regular agenda. Do we need to adopt it, Madam Clerk? We do. It seems like an odd thing to do at the state of the meeting, but we do. Okay. I'm so the motion ahead. will just read that the special agenda be adopted as circulated. Move around a seconder, please. Move by Deputy Mayor Dunlop, second by uh, Councillor McIntyre. All in favor? As carried. Thank you. Okay, Conf reports from officials. We have none. Confirmation bylaw, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So the motion reads that bylaw number 2022-54 be and is hereby read a first, second, third time and finally passed. Move on a seconder, please. Move by Councillor Stevens, second by who would like to second it? Oh, Cap Councillor Brennan. All in favor? That is carried. Adjournment, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you. That this meeting being is hereby adjourned at 11.32 a.m. Move on a seconder, please. Move by Councillor Cox, second by Councillor Stevens. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your day.